Good evening, everyone, and welcome to yet another webinar from Math Revolution. Uh, before I start, just want to see on the numbers uh, that we have experienced and those are changed. Uh, I cannot calculate it as there is a much change, but we readily have to see what all this 2021 will bring for everyone. So with a kind note of Happy New Year, I start my today's webinar on behalf of Math Revolution. One of the most important topic which formulates the major part of GMAT quant, GMAT math, integers, our number properties. Readily the question does come from the basic to the highest level from Q30 to Q51. I have been noticing that there are experts like you who often tend to make mistakes or silly errors in this sort of questions. That could be because of some unwanted comprehension or you know overexcitement or anything there is missing. So I would always say that you know you have to be very, very good with this sort of topic because this is, I mean, like if you find out the regression analysis for the GMAT, this is one of the key topic that uh, cumulative gives uh, upper edge to the score building. So I again uh, welcome everyone and let's start with today's part. Let's see what do we have in today's agenda. I'll be talking about math revolution along with the GMAT math overview. Uh, that is something which I have been doing in my every webinar. Integer basics is our topic. So yes, integer advance is our next webinar topic. And uh, conventional approach versus math revolution approach is often that I have been talking about. So established in 2001 in South Korea, growing with a lot of visitors and you know uh, solution providers. It's been like 190 plus country site visits and 130 plus country members. It brings in a lot of crowd to Math Revolution to come up with something unique, uh, something which were required for students to crack their GMAT math. And uh, this achievement has been par and cannot be expressed in few words. So there in where I always speak about it, over 41,000 until now. And 90% uh, of his students have been scoring 49 out of 51. So these days we have been doing a lot of exercises for the students. The first part is webinar that we often conduct on Sundays. So it's like seven days gap and we often conduct seminars. If I'm not wrong, this is the 11th webinar that we have conducted. And uh, so all the 10 webinars our DS was repeated in the middle because there was requirement and there was a lot of students who asked to repeat it. So I readily did, did it. And uh, apart from it, uh, we have conducted some webinars on GMAT club as well. So yeah, that is a journey of a webinar. Secondly, the consultation call, one-on-one -on -one free consultation call that I have been taking these days. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, it brings in too much to connect with the GMAT aspirants to understand, you know, what is the struggling factor. It's not always about raising the scorecards. I've seen uh, getting raised from 30 to 45 is quite significant in comparison to a raise of 45 to 47 and 47 to 49. 47 is a stagnant point and it brings in a lot of frustrations. And I mean it when I say it brings in a lot of frustrations because when you can hit 47 in your uh, mock test or in your real official GMAT, that means you know things. But again, what is it that, you know, that those four pointers are still away? So I've been discussing in details about it. I understand 20 minutes is not enough, but I try my best to, uh, you know, give all my insights and uh, strategies that most of the students have applying. And recently I've got a scorecard of, uh, you know, few students of mine who have followed the same strategies and uh, they were able to hit 51. So, I mean, that is somewhere, you know, brings in a lot of confidence to me to come up with such approaches. Uh, after listening to the struggle that, you know, uh, or the errors that has been made by the students, same thing had happened in the past years uh, with someone 
known as Max Lee, and therein where he thought to come up with a unique approach so that that scary DS factor is no more a scary factor. He inputted his lot of efforts, patience, hard work, and time, solving almost hundred thousand questions, and then he gifted us a unique variable approach to solve the DS questions. After which, it was quite easy to tackle those DS situations and tricky situations. So yes, the goal of GMAT Math is all about you know, uh, not forty-five, but it's a fifty-fifty-one. And to score that, you should have variable approach for DS and IV approach for PS. And this is the person I was actually talking about. So if I could come up with some strategies that is helping his students. He is the one who has brought that particular strategy, which has given me a foundation to talk about it. So he's a founder and a CEO, master's degree in mathematics that is topology, and has taken GMAT himself 27 times with maximum perfect score. And he is world's first variable approach uh, in, I would say, inventor. So you know, this is wherein we have been good so far. Characteristics is like very basics. We talk about uniqueness because that's our first variable approach and IV approach. We talk about math skills, so it's not at all required that you should have a math background, even if you're from economics or from you know any other background, maybe from business, finance. Uh, you could easily, you know, mental that particular approaches and learn those very in a very disciplined manner. And quickness is like you know you all always always have at least ten minutes to spare before your exam. Accuracy is that accuracy is must. I mean like we do require accuracy. So that is wherein we talk about. Now let's talk about the strategies for fifty fifty one. Conventional approach given in the official guide and something which we were taught during our high schools. Is okay. I mean, like I won't comment on the fact that they cannot help us uh, in getting fifty fifty one, but the amount of students getting fifty fifty one through those approaches are few. And uh, for me, if I talk about the data set of all those students, they will be simple outlier. So my regression fit doesn't matter or happen to be fit into those lines. Maximum number of students will fit onto that particular line, which are not. 50 51 but they are close to 42 43 44 42 43 44 and in regression analysis it's always a best line fit so again that is not a proper solution to it so coming on to the other hand then when we had the variable approach and iv approach could see that there was not lot of dispersed data and you know most of the students were able to score 50 51 through this particular strategies So now going ahead with something for which we have gathered today, it's the definition of uh, integers. Now we are starting with something which we would be definitely talking about. So keep your pen and a paper handy, and uh, let's start the journey for today's webinar. We're talking about the very basic term, which is the first term, integers. Anything apart from fraction or a decimal component would be considered to be integer. If you have considered them along with zero and negatives, so whenever there is a word called integer into your question set, you need to be very sure of considering zero and negatives. And of course, positive can easily be taken through through because that is not a real challenge. But now there lies two more concept into this. There is a non-negative integers and there is a non-positive integers. Zero is a neutral value, cannot be considered as a positive or a negative. So, if a question says it's a non-positive integers, that means you need to consider negatives and zeros both. Wherein, if it says non-negative integers, then you should have considered all the positives and zeros too. So, this is one of the key factor that you should always remember about. So, let's solve a pretty easy or maybe a difficult question. I'm not sure. I'll just solve it. So, what is the smallest possible value? So, I'm talking about the smallest possible value of absolute of x plus y or mod of x plus y for two integers. The question is based on integers, which is satisfying x y equals to twelve. So, now the product of x and y is equals to twelve, and I need to understand what is the smallest possible value of x plus y. 
Now understand this fact that x times y equals to 12. And I'm dealing with the addition of those two integers involved. But that too is an absolute value. So these are the two concepts or the factors that we have to keep in our mind. So we understand that integers are possibly values from minus infinity to infinity, uh, adding up to zeros as well. Now, when x y equals to 12, when the two factors give you a positive result, then both should have the same sign. So, e so you know, either a case could be like when x and y both are positive or both are negative. So getting 12 would be much easier for me to understand, like it could be 1 times 12, 6 times 2, or 4 times 3, or 3 times 4, 12, 6 times 2. It will hardly make a difference because we are dealing with x plus y, which is a commutative property. And that is where you know, we are getting a pair from a xy, which is a multiplication, which is again a commutative property. So either you do 1 times 12 or 12 times 1, it doesn't make a lot of difference. So the ordered pair that we could get is 1, 12, 2, 6, and 3, 4. Now let's understand the different possible combinations because I've already told you that integers has to be taken negative as well. So I could easily get minus 12 times minus one. So now this is where you know, it makes a difference. So X plus Y, one plus 12 or minus one minus 12. Absolute value will again give me the positive result. So that becomes 13. For two, six, six, two, minus two, minus six, minus six, minus two, it would be eight. For four and three, it would be seven. So now out of these three values, which I have got on the screen, 13, 8, and 7, the smallest possible value is 7. So my answer goes as C. Um, job is done. Now let's move on to the very basic concept, which is an even and odd integer. We already know what an even is, what an odd is, but this is very much applied during the DS questions. So even anything, integers that is divisible by 2. 0 is also an even integer because 0 is divided by 2. Now include both positives and negative integers. So minus two is also an uh, you know, even integer. So always pay attention to the negatives along with zeros. And integers, those are not divisible by two are a data set of odd integers. So minus three is also an odd. So now if n is an integer, it's been defined n is an integer, it could be negative, positive, or zero. Which of the following must be an odd integer? Now the basic format for this is, we should know that you know they're talking about the odd integer, so my mind should give me a signal of concept of even and odd at the same time. So even are like two n, two times n, n being zero. I'll always get that particular series. Odd integers could be two n uh, minus one. So there, in so, you know, we have to talk about an option that can get me an odd integers here. So let's pick an option first, which is two n minus n. Now 2n is already, 2n minus n, it depends upon, you know, it's not necessary that it would be always an odd because it depends upon the n here. 2n plus n, again, the same condition, like, you know, it would always depend upon the value of n does it take, because if n becomes zero, then it could be a different one. If n becomes one, it could be a different one. Three plus n, Again, when you're adding three, if I add one to three, then it becomes four. If I add two to three, it becomes five. So again, that n comes into a picture. Depending upon the value of n, you would get an even or an odd. And my question is asking, must be an odd integer. Now question, option D, it says minus of n plus one, minus one, minus three n. So three times n, again, that makes a huge difference. So there in where I know that it would be always even. It's never odd because if I just simplify it, I get minus n plus one minus one plus three n, which is two n, and two n is always even. So now a, b, c, d is gone. So I know that e would be my option n plus one minus three n, which is minus one minus two n. So one minus two n is always odd. So in this particular manner, but we understand, guys, I have not put the values. This is wherein I have found most of the students they just start keeping values. And when you say n is an integer, you need to always consider the negative positives and zero. So consider how many values would you put to just solve this question. Like for every n, there could be three possible values. And there are five options right now here. So that goes as 15 sets that you would cross check every time. That doesn't work at all. So you need to be very, very, uh, you know, virtual and you need to be very good into your mental calculations 
you can imagine what an is and you could just write it on the paper what you're getting out of it the more you avoid yourself keeping the numbers and checking it out in such kind of question the more you will be able to save the time i agree to the point that it will not come uh, in a one day but it will definitely come if you try to gain over it but again if you make a habit of putting in the numbers you will be always confident in getting the answer but you have never tried a shortcut approaches so always always give it yourself a time to you know learn the shortcut approaches and get the answer and save your time so now this is done now let's talk about the operations with the integers i mean this is very basic uh, something which we learned during our high school or before that so multiplication and addition now this is something i was about to talk any integer times even integer would be an even integer now i don't want you to actually do it like 1 times 2 is 2 1 times 4 is 4 because if you start doing it then again the same case is you are applying the numbers odd integer is into odd so these are some you know uh, quick up, uh, quick tips that you could always always work out so even plus even is a even odd plus odd is a even and you know with the multiplications and additions and subtraction you should always always have this thing with you ready because there are questions there in where you have to do it and if you start applying the numbers into it it will becomes more difficult the question becomes lengthy so now let's try uh, you know solving this question when n is an integer which of the following must be an odd i could directly see 2n can never ever be an odd because that would be an even n plus 2 now depends n plus 2 2 is already an even number so it can be both even or odd so because if you add up even to a even you get even even to an odd you get odd 3 times n now 3 times n can be odd and even both because 3 itself is an odd number so in the first part we knew that 2n is a even second part we knew that you know n could be an odd or a even third part is multiplication of an odd number to to an order or even so that again makes a sense d part is 2n minus 1 it's n minus 1 plus n which is ideally 2n minus 1 which is always be an odd n is square again depends upon like you know what is the value of n will give you even and odd values so d is your correct answer there is no point of keeping values i'm again repeating the same thing <clears throat> now let's talk about something which is very much interesting whenever i see this particular term ds i don't first follow the question the first thing which i always follow is the variable approach the first signal that my mind gives after reading that word ds is variable approach so if a and b are integers so i have two variables is a b an even number answer should be c so this is how i always make it out while reading just a question but now this is an integer so I, it's a key question that is where i high, i know the trap so let's go with uh, this variable approach slowly for this question so we know that you know a and b are integers and they're asking about the product of a and b so we have to go with the operation of multiplication so let's understand when we could get even number so we can multiply even with a even to get even even with a odd to get even but only the third condition which is odd times odd gives me an odd number so now if i uh, go on ahead with it the first approach i mean the variable approach the first step is odd, always to modify and recheck the original condition and questions in this particular set of question i cannot just uh, modify a lot in this so i'll just take only to what is been asked whether a, a b is an even number uh, where a and b are integers so there is nothing much to you know modify but yes there is one thing which i can always always say that you know condition let us look at the condition number 2 it says b is an even number so ab equals to even is ab an even number if b is already an even number doesn't matter whatever the a is you will always get it as an even number so your answer choice has already been done here the question is already been solved that it's a condition 2 which is alone sufficient now condition number 1 it says a is an odd number but b is unknown so now the concern is b is odd if you take b is an odd odd times odd becomes odd 
but if b is an even odd times even becomes an even so you are getting possibly no and yes both so cmt1 always says that you should have a unique yes or no so condition 2 alone is sufficient now the trap is they'll show you the question in such a way that you know when you see this two condition you will not not focus on the second condition alone this is a trap you will see a is an odd b is an even odd times even is a even both conditions satisfy answer is c that is why we you when you apply the variable approach a and b you see two variables and to match up the two variables you need two equation that means answer should be c but when it's a key questions like integer before marking c you need to always check a and b and there in where i know that even if it is coming as c i can still say myself because i have to check a and b so there in where again the variable approach saved me because i didn't mark just looking at odd and even and i'm telling it to you right now we have time so you can you know you can idly see this question for like 5 minutes and you can easily solve it but when it is a exam zone that particular pressure zone when you had done lot of questions before and you still know there are a lot of questions to come through you don't pay much attention and you are very much into you know hurry so therefore gmac always trap questions they will talk about ab as an even number your mind will say even times even okay fine even odd okay even even odd this is what it is showing b is even a is odd okay let's combine ab odd done but we forget to take things that b is an even number so now variable approach tells me this fact that if it is an integer question before marking c go ahead and check a and b separately so variable approach does not only give me a uh, you know an upper edge on getting to know the answer just reading the questions at the start but also helps me to save from all those particular traps that a gmat can build up all right trying uh, talking about a prime and a composite number there are a lot of questions in the prime numbers and composite numbers in ds so prime number has always got two factors that is one in itself and because of this one is not a prime number because we at we should have two factors there is no at least or there is no at most it's always exact two factors so one is not a prime number or uh, two is the only even prime number because all other even numbers are divisible by two so therefore they cannot be the prime number itself and then all the odd uh, i'll not say all the odd numbers but remaining all prime numbers except two are odd so this is wherein we talk about the prime numbers the composite numbers have a different uh, factor so it's the integer that has to be greater than 1 and that is not a prime number so if i talk about 4 i can write it as 2 times 2 uh, if i talk about 6 that is 2 into 3 so it's a product of a prime number again so that's what i say as a composite number now let's talk about this question what is the sum of the three greatest two digit composite numbers sum of three greatest two digit composite numbers now understand this fact very clearly we need a composite numbers not a prime numbers so we are first of all dealing with two digit number so the number is starts from 10 and ends up at 99 so my range is from 10 to 99 inclusive secondly i am only talking about the composite number i don't have to deal with the prime numbers now they are asking about the greatest so definitely my scope of attention is uh, goes to 99 so 99 is not a prime 98 is not a prime so i'm not making any error here now 97 so now that can make an error because 97 is not a prime 97 is not a composite number i'm sorry 97 is a prime so the number that i have to take next is 96 and now adding 99 98 and 96 is not a big deal we have 3 times 90 so that becomes you know 270 and then we have uh 9 plus 8 plus 6 so my ultimately answer goes as 293 that is it now let's understand the characteristics and properties of 0 and 1 now after going through this slide you will understand that was it beneficial or not we know one is an integer but it is not a prime nor a composite number so you can multiply 1 to n n to get the same number you can divide by 1 to get the same number if you just multiply an n by its reciprocal that's a multiplicative inverse you always get 1 division of a number by the same number always gives you 
zero is an integer okay it's neither a prime nor a composite neither a positive nor a negative number it's an even number so multiplication of any number by zero gives you zero dividing any number by zero is undefined we cannot divide it uh, zero often falls under the additive properties uh, you know add, addition of a number to zero or zero adding to a number gives me the same number and zero is divisible by all the numbers so you know the characteristics and properties of zero zero is a multiple of all the integers always remember this one is factor of all the integers please remember this there are some questions which even you know they have gone through my eyes when i was just doing the solution posting on the gmat club and these are the properties that were applied there so zero is a multiple of integers it's one is a factor of all integers now let's talk about something which is pretty obvious to see on the gmat n divided by 7 gives me a remainder 9 and same n dividing by 6 gives me a remainder of 4 and this sort of remainder quotient and dividend questions are pretty common and at times tricky uh, may take lot of amount of time and we know the first step to be taken to solve this sort of question but you know we always struggle to how to continue the solution where to end it up the first step is pretty easy if someone understand the better relationship between dividend divisor quotient and remainders but again the concern here happens is what is it that you know uh, how to end up the solution so dividend quotients and remainders if we talk about let's go with the basic format so the quotient is denoted by q dividend here is denoted by n remainder is r i have a positive integer p which is a divisor so i can often write dividend which is n in terms of p q and r so dividend n would be nothing but it is equals to p times q plus r if there is any so suppose if i take a particular number 8 and if i'm dividing it by 3 8 is my divisor 8 is my dividend 3 is my divisor my question would be 2 so that becomes q 3 times 2 and my remainder would be r which is 2 now this first three lines are pretty common and known but the next two lines are something if you could remember your half job is already done the remainder is never negative it is never less than divide it is less than divisor always so r would be always greater than equals to 0 but less than p now if divisor is negative then you can always put the absolute for p so remainder r would be always less than the absolute value of p if divisor is negative let's talk about this question when a positive integer m is divided so m becomes divisor is divided by the positive integer n so n becomes so over here i'm dividing m that becomes dividend i'm dividing it by n that becomes divisor the remainder is 8 r is 8 quotient is unknown if m over n gives me 32.16 what is the value of n now this is what we know that if your question is q dividend is n divisor is p and remainder is r and if you're dealing with a positive divisor your remainder would definitely lie between 0 and p for negative it would lie between 0 inclusive and absolute value of p less than so then when we know to find the value of n just write the equation so a positive integer m is divided so m equals to n times q plus 8 now this 8 has to be greater than equals to 0 and less than n now this is what you could do when you have m over n 
you could write that m equals to n q plus eight divided by n. If you distribute that particular n, you always get q plus eight over n is equals to thirty two point one six. Now, how do you interpret this thirty two point one six? So till thirty two, it was purely divisible, and remainder was zero. But that point one six. Has created a remainder. So Q happens to be thirty-two, and eight over n that becomes zero point one six. That is how we have represented and broken thirty-two point one six. Now eight over n is equals to zero point one six. That means eight is less than n. This is what we got. So eight happens to be zero point one six n. So n becomes fifty. So your C is the correct option. So this is wherein we see the application of relationship between dividend, divisor, quotient, and remainder. Now let's talk about the first n positive integers and non-negative integers. So the first five integers are starting from one are one two three four five. The second five positive integers. So the five integers are starting from two. Understand the second five positive integers. The five integers are starting from two. They are two three four five six. The first five non-negative integers are zero one two three four. So never get confused with the second five positive integers. They are not six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It has always a number they are have to start from. Please pay attention to the wordings. They are pretty, pretty catchy. Now this is something that we had been learning in the grade three or four. How do we write digits? What are their international place value system? how to make two digit number or a three digit number how to round off right so this is where in you know the digit came into picture this is how the digit look like so we have a decimal here so everything on the left part of the decimal goes with unit digit tens hundreds thousand 10000 millions 10 millions billions on the right part there is nothing called a unit it's always a start with tens that is 1 over 10 Hundreds, one over hundred; thousands, one over thousand; ten thousand. So on the left part you start multiplying, on the right part you always divide. This is how a particular digit look like or a number look like. Now this is the second expression of digits. So my first digit is two, not five. My second digit is three. My third digit is fourth, four, and my fourth digit is five, which is the last digit. Let's talk about the third expression of digits. If n is a two-digit integer, when I say the word forty-five, I am I'm, I'm actually saying four zero forty plus five into it. So five is at the unit place. So five times one. Now, how did I form form forty by getting four multiplied to ten? Why the why did I multiply ten? Because that's its place value. That's a tens digit. So a two-digit integer or a number can always be written as ten times a plus b, where a is a tens digit and b is the unit digit. There are a lot of questions on this. There, in where we form a two-digit number or a three-digit number, we reverse those, and we can always, always have a lot of questions based on this concept. If we have to form a three-digit number, then we know that we are dealing with hundred tens and units. So hundred times x. Ten times y and z. This is how I form. So if my number is three hundred and sixty-one, I'm myself is speaking the same. Three hundred. So three hundred plus sixty plus one. One times one is unit place. Six times ten is the tens place. Three times hundred is the hundreds place. So this is a very basic expression. Now let's solve a question on the basic of this. If n is a two-digit integer, so we are just dealing with the tens and the unit place. 
where x is the tens digit. So they have already given us what is the tens digit. So n is a two digit integer where x is the tens digit of n and y is the unit digits of n. What is the value of y squared in terms of n and x? So you need to get the unit digit first and then square it so that you can get the value in terms of n and x. So let's talk about the expression of digit. We're dealing with a two digit integer here. So that would be written in terms of 10 times n plus b. Let's understand what the information is given in the question. n is a two digit integer, x is tens digit, y is the unit digit. Let's form the number first. So n becomes 10 times x plus y. Now, as we are dealing in terms of y, the question is asking about y, we'll simply rearrange the equation to get y equals to n minus 10x. Squaring this particular number is not a big deal. Now, even without squaring, ideally, you could get the very simple answer like n minus 10x is a whole squared. It's simple logic of a minus b whole squared. Whenever we does a plus b whole squared or a minus b whole squared, the only difference it makes is plus 2ab and minus 2ab. So the two squares part, n square and 100, will not make a difference to anything. The only difference it will make would be the minus and the plus sign. So b and e are obviously out. So we are just left with a, d, and c. Now multiplying this, c doesn't work because we are dealing with 10, so that has to be 100. So we need 100 actually. So only answer that is left out is A. So this is wherein you could save a lot of your time if you could do the mental calculation. So you don't have to read, actually square it, but you can directly see to the options and mark the correct answer. Let's talk about the unit digits, the cyclicity patterns, and all those particular thought of concepts. Now the last digit in a whole number or the digit before the decimal point is a unit digit. Like one, two, three, four, five, five is the unit digit. 67.897 is the unit digit. Let's talk about the power of a number. Unit digit remains the same or repeat after every second or fourth power. Now this is something we'll see in the upcoming slides, but just remember unit digit remains the same or repeat after every second or fourth power. Know that the unit digit of the base numbers reoccurs periodically. So we have to see this unit digit question. So whenever there is a unit digit question that they are actually dividing n by 5 or a 10. So remember when you get when dividing n by 5 or a 10. So you know it's all about remember when you divide the unit digit by a 5 or a 10. So this is how we actually comprehend or interpret a question. So if they're asking a unit digit question, that means they're dividing it by five or 10. And what is it they are dividing? They're dividing the unit digit by five or 10. So if we talk about the unit digit cyclicity, let's take for three. So three to the power one is three. Three squared is nine. Three cube is 27. And we are just dealing with the unit digit. So slide will only show the unit digit so that is seven three to the power four is 81 there's no concern of eight so i'll just end up writing one three to the power five is three so now what i have always understood is if there is a number and if you're raising it if there is a single digit number and if you're raising itself to a power of a five you will always get the same number at the unit digit so three to the power five three 4 to the power 5, 4, 5 to the power 5 is 5, 6 to the power 5, 6, 2 to the power 5, 2. So that is what it has been said that, you know, every number repeats itself after fourth power. After fourth power, that means at the fifth power. Deepak, you have comprehended it wrong. And it's not how divided by 5 is unit digit. It's all about if we have to divide something by five and have to find something, or if you have a number divide, which has to be divided by five or a 10, that means we have to make sure that we divide the unit digit because that is the only last digit which will define whether the division is possible or not. So we need to divide a unit digit by five to get to know the answer. Yeah. Okay. So going ahead now, the pattern here is three, nine, seven, one, three, nine, seven, one. 
Now, similar kind of pattern can be seen for seven with a different numbers. Seven to the power one is seven. Seven is square is forty nine. So I take nine. Seven cube is three four three. So I take three. Seven to the power four is two four zero one. So I take one. Again, seven to the power five will repeat itself at seven. Two is pretty simple. So we have been dealing with one zero two four five one zero two four kilobytes, five hundred and twelve MB, two hundred and fifty six. So they are pretty common numbers to us in our daily usage of data as well. So two four eight sixteen six. So this is for two. It is pretty easy. For eight, eight to the power one is eight. Eight to the power two is sixty four. So that gets me eight. Eight cube is five one two. That gets me two. Eight to the power four is four zero nine six. That gets me six. Eight to the power five is again an eight. So the again the repetition that or the pattern that I'm getting is eight four two six. For the other numbers, if you see, you know, like for four, four to the power one is four. Four is square is sixteen. Four cube is again sixty four. So you're ending up with four. So the pattern that you're getting here is four six four six four six. That is why I said that the unit digit repetition can always be seen on the second power or after the fourth power. Similarly, for nine, if you see nine to the power one is nine. Nine is square is eighty one. So nine one nine one. This is how what we get it. Now there are some beautiful numbers that no matter whatever power you raise it to, you will always end up with the same numbers like zero, one, five, and six. So zero is one of those. One is one of those. Five is one of those, and six is one of those. So ideally, we multiply the same number to itself to get the same number. Now let's talk about this particular number. What is the unit digit of two to the power nineteen? There was a reason I have taken this particular question in today's webinar. I know it is pretty easy webinar, a uh, pretty easy question. But again, the reason behind taking this question was just to see how many of his students actually go ahead and solve this question. Because for me, when I looked at this question, I directly marked the answer as C and just went ahead. But they, I have seen what happens is like you know we learn so much that we always always make a mistake to understand where that particular question actually want me to solve the question or is it just looking at it and I could get maximum answer out of it. If I see it this particular question, what happens is unit digit. Okay, so my mind says this is a question of unit digit. There are certain numbers raised to the power. I'll quickly pick two to the power nineteen. Get into the power of four to get a unit digit for three and five and seven. Why do I forget a one fact that five will always give me five? Five will always give me five, right? And if you're multiplying five to a particular number that are here, we have two also here. So the answer should directly go as what zero. But it's okay because I just want to show you the property of how the unit digit cyclicity cyclicity goes. So for two we have a pattern of two four eight six, for three we have a pattern of three nine seven one, seven we have a pattern, then five we again have a pattern. So if we just break it here, but let me solve it for the students once. So we have four numbers here which are raised to the some powers two. Three, five, and seven. Now let's talk about the cyclicity of two. This is something which we learned in the previous slides. So two always have a pattern of two, four, eight, six. You don't have to cram it. You can quickly do it because see, what will you get cramming out of it? What will you get cramming out of it? Concern is this because if this question is not there in your exam. Then there is no point of that particular thing which you have learned. So, the much better or the best part is whenever such sort of question comes in, you can simply write this pattern quickly, like two to the power one is two to square. So you get this pattern two four eight six. Similarly for three, you can write this pattern three nine seven one. For seven, you can have this pattern, and then for five. You can have this pattern. Once you're done, let's go back to the question. So we will, when the question is only talking about the unit digit, 
will only include the unit digit of it. Now, the most important part here, why am I solving this question is just because if there was no five, then definitely I need a solution for this. That five has made my life easier to get to me answer zero. But let's say if there was no five, then what? So let's solve this question together. Now two to the power 19. Now I know that after the fourth power, it would always be a repetition. So always break this powers in terms of four. Now 19 is not completely divisible by four. So I know four times four, which is 16. I'm still left out with three parts. So how will I write this two to the power 19 as two to the power of four times four plus three. Similarly, for three, I'll write four times five plus one. For five, I'll write four times three plus three. And for seven, I will write four times one plus three. Now, don't get confused. When this is a plus, exponent property says that means over here it was five cube. Because if your bases are same, then only your powers are added. Now, this is the beauty, you know, this is wherein, you know, the math comes into a picture. We have always been taught that if LHS happens like this, then you will get something on the RHS side. And the exams like GMAT, GRE, they will often form a particular question in which you have to apply the RHS side. They'll give you the RHS side already, and they need to see whether the student can go back to the LHS from where it derived. So over here, if I say two to the power two times two to the power three, most of us can do it two to the power five. But now they're giving us like this, they've added this power. So I need to break it into terms of base and power. So two to the power four times four, this plus three, that means over here, it was two cube. Over here, it was three. Over here, it was five cube. Over here, it was seven cube. So now two to the power four times four, I know it will always repeat. So my answer will not make much change. It will be just two cube times three times five cube times seven cube. Now two cube is eight, three to the power one is three, five cube will always end up with five, seven cube will give you three. Now you already have a five here. If you multiply it by eight, you'll get zero. So your unit digit goes as zero. So when you solve most of this particular question, you'll often see that it's pretty easy. And this technique is very much uh, effective when you solve the question which asks for the Remainders. So this was the trick that I applied at the start. Now let's talk about the DS. What is the unit digit of 18 to the power n? Now I, I don't know what that n is, but I on, always know this that this is raised to the power of 8. So the cyclicity or anything that I can do is with the 8. Now the question is when n is divided by 4, the remainder is 3. And when n is divided by five, the remainder is three again. So let's talk about this. I'll be definitely applying the variable approach. We are just dealing with the last digit number because we have to find the unit digit. So now the concern here is we are talking about eight. I'll quickly write my pattern for eight, which is eight, four, two, six, eight, four, two, six. After having written this particular cyclicity for eight, I'll go on my first step and I'll see how to modify or recheck the original condition, which says the unit digit of 18 to the power of n. So the pattern I have already been known is 8426, 8426. And 8 always occurs or reoccurs itself periodically after every fourth power. Now the question says you to find the value. So now when n is divided by 4, so if it is getting divided by four, the cycle repeats after every fourth power. So A is the correct answer. When n is divided by five, now let's understand this before going to the second condition. When n is divided by four, the remainder is three. Go back to the divisor dividend logic and come back with the, that particular relationship. I, we can always write n equals to four K plus three. Now, when I'm writing n equals to 4k plus 3, I can raise this 18 in terms of 4k plus 3. Now, 18 to the power of 4k won't make much difference because that is a fourth power. 
so the only difference it will make is 8 to the power of 3 that is the left out part and i can always find the unit digit of 8 to the power 3 according to the pattern now similarly if i go with the second condition which says n is divided by 5 the remainder is 3 I can write it as n equals to five k plus three. Now, if n equals to three, the unit digit would be eighteen to the power three. If n is equals to eight, the unit digit will change. So now, depending upon that, this n or whatever the number you're getting divided by five, if if the number is three, you will have a different power. If a number is eight, you will again have a different power. So second condition is not giving me sufficient answer because it was not in terms of four. Let's talk about the general remainder questions. There, in where direct substitution has always worked, it's pretty simple questions, and we can directly substitute the numbers, and then we could add up the least common multiples of the divisor to that number. So find the first overlapping number is the first uh, process, and then add the least common multiples of divisor. The remainder question. This is a shortcut for the remainder question that comes into the DS question. When the divisor in the original condition, by the original condition I mean the question. So when the divisor in the question is a factor of divisor in the condition. So if you could have if you could see a divisor in the original condition or a question that is a factor of the divisor that is given into your statement 1 or a 2 that particular statement will be sufficient now let's see how do we uh, solve a ps question based out of it it says when a is a positive integer when a a positive integer n is divided by 7 the remainder is 4 and when n is divided by 8 the remainder is 3 so there the n is been divided by two different numbers and giving me two different uh remainders and now the same n has to be divided by 14 to get me the remainder so it's a, again a remainder question direct substitution is possible but i have to make sure one thing that first of all i find a overlapping number and then i'll add up the lcm so now how to actually uh, form the you know expression for this so we'll again apply the same logic the relationship between dividend divisor quotient and remainder and we'll take each part separately so let's talk about the first part n is divided by 7 so n becomes dividend 7 is divisor i don't know the quotient obviously so that becomes x for me in this question And remainder is four, so I could write it as n is equals to seven times x plus four. Now, if I put x equals to zero, the first number happens to be four. If I put n equals to uh, sorry x equals to one, the second number is eleven. And this is how I'll with the difference of seven, I'll always get the next number. So I could add up seven to get the next number. If you see this n equals to seven x plus four, for me it's a straight line equation where it's a slope of seven, so it would always give you an addition of 7 to the number so this is how you understand the 7x with the every addition of x there will be always a increase of 7 now let's talk about the second part which says n is divided by 8 so n is equals to 8y plus 3 now this says that you know with every addition of y there would be an addition of or where every increase of y there would be addition of 8 with 3 at the start so if y equals to 0 i had 3 If I equals to one, I have eleven. So the first common number or the overlapping number that my series here are getting is eleven. Now since I've got the eleven as my common number, so my first step is done. My overlapping number that is eleven is done. The second part was what is the LCM of seven and eight? So LCM of seven and eight is fifty-six. So just add up that fifty-six to eleven to get. The answer is sixty-seven. So, is that the answer? So now, see, 
every time when you add this 56 you always get a number so 56 you get a 67 so 67 plus 56 you get the next number is 123 so this is how you always get the number so 11 plus 56 k is the number so in the first case you just pay attention to this Eleven divided by fourteen. Remainder is eleven. Sixty-seven divided by fourteen. Remainder is always eleven, because the number formed is eleven plus fifty-six k. You change on the value of k, you will always get an increase of fifty-six, and your series has started from eleven. So eleven would be a remainder. Well, let's talk about the divisibility rule. So if there are three positive integers, m, n, and p, and if I write p is equals to m times n, that means p is divisible by both m and n. This, seriously, this looks a very simple uh, fundamental property, but let me tell you, most of the people always struggle to know where this should be applied. The question is formed in such a way that we could not even get a hint where we could apply this. So this is what you guys have to learn. You don't have to learn how to divide, how to multiply. You have to learn how to apply this and where it should be applied. So this is one logic that P is equals to MN and then P is divisible by both M and N. Now when P is divided by M, the remainder is zero. When P is divided by N, the remainder should be zero. And when P is divided by M and the remainder should be zero, that is what we say it is divisible. So now if this question says for positive integers M N and P, if P is divisible by M and M is divisible by N. So P is divisible by M and M is divisible by N. So you need to tell when P is divided by N, what is the remainder? It should be zero. But again, let's see. It could be one as well. It could be two, three, or can we determine it or not? So divisibility is simple. If P equals to MN, that means this both are P is divisible by both. And remainder should be always zero. So let's talk about this. If P is divisible by M, that means I can write it as P equals to M times K. M is divisible by N, that means M is equals to N times S. So if I replace or substitute the value of m in p equals to mk, I'll get p is equals to nsk plus zero, which is the remainder. That shows p is already divided by n. This is something which I said just reading the question at the start. Again, please don't put numbers into it to check. Okay, this is one more important thing, factors which are also divisors and multiple. It's common confusions many a times. What are factors? So the integers which can divide into P without a remainder. So if I have to factor, find the factors of number P, I have to find those integers which can divide P, leaving no remainder. If I have to find a multiple of a number m, then I need the integer p, which can be obtained when m multiplies with another integer. So multiple is nothing but it's a table. And factors are the divisors which gives remainders. A simple concept for both. So let's say this is a question. And factorial is, you know, factorial is something which is very much uh, I mean, GMAC loves factorials, especially in terms of number properties and integers kind of question. So if three to the power n is a factor of 15 factorial, and they'll always try giving you the big factorials, which one cannot even think to expand and find the answer. So if three to the power n is a factor of 15 factorial, then what is the greatest possible value of n? So by what power of n, 
or by what power of three, how much power you can raise that three, uh, like be it one, so that gets you three, three square nine, three cube 27, 81. So what is that number that would be a factor of 15 factorial? So now when we are talking about a factor, we need to understand a factor of a number is an integer that divides that particular number, giving you a remainder zero. So now let's talk about this. 15 factorial is nothing, it's a product of positive integers till 15. Also understand the multiple. Now see, this is where we have to understand they are asking about the factor. Do I have to apply the multiple logic here or not? Do I have to take that into consideration or not? Because that factor word is pretty open. So that can make me understand that I have to apply the logic of factors. But the multiple part is hidden here. That is what we need to understand. So we'll understand what is a multiple, what are the multiples of three up to 15. So let's say three, six, nine, 12, and 15. So we have these numbers. So when we have these numbers, then the best thing which we could do right now here is 15 factorial is like 1 to 15. A product of 1 to 15. If I just separate all those factors, oh sorry, the multiples of 3, like 3, 6, 9, 12 and 15, the other numbers remains are 1, 2, 3. So 3 is already in the other group, 4, 5, 6 is in the other group and so on. Now write this 3, 6, 9, 12 and 15 in terms of 3. So three is three to the power one, six is three to the power one times two to the power one, nine is three squared, 12 can be written as three into two squared, 15 is written as three into the power, three to the power one, five to the power one. So if I combine all these threes, I'll get it as six at the end, three to the power six, I've got two times four times five, I will still have one, two, 13, 14 numbers left. So I have this three, three n as a factor. I can write it as three to the power six times two, four, five times one, two, three. Now two, four, five times one times two times three or one times two times seven times eight times 10 times. This is all going to give me an integer. So the highest power that I've got of three here is six. So it's not only about the factor part, but the multiple plays a very important role. If you could get a hold of multiples in that particular stretch value of fact, uh, factorial, your job will be done. And they will be always asking you such kind of questions in the factorial, and you will be always seeing the multiples into it and the factors. So we start looking at the factors first, and then we go to find the multiples. So what is the relationship between a factor and a multiple? So they are opposite concept. A factor is a divisor. A multiple is a multiple. You multiply an integer by an integer to get its new multiple. So this is again a question here. For positive integer m, m is a factor of 12. So m is a factor of 12. That means m can divide 12, giving a remainder 0. And m is a multiple of 12. So m also occurs in the Table of 12. This is what they mean to say. Which of the following can be value of M? Now this question, when we understand it properly, that M has to be a factor of 12. That means it should divide 12, giving remainder 0. M is a multiple of 12. That means it should come. Uh, so 12 when multiplied to one of the integer gives me M. That is what I mean to say. So the only possibility that I left out with the numbers given in the options are is 12. Now, how do I say that? Just because when I say m is a factor of 12, that means I can write 12 is equals to m times t. When I'm multiplying m to something, which is a quotient t. So this is the same relationship. Divisor is equals to dividend into quotient. The only difference here is we don't have a remainder because it's a factor. So plus r portion is zero. So 12 is equals to m times t. And m is a multiple of 12. So m equals to 12 times s. Now, this is opposite concept. This is what we are writing. Now, if we just substitute the value of m from m equals to 12s here, we get 12 is equals to 12s t. And this is only possible when s and t is equals to 1. 
also looking at the options also we could easily solve it that we need a number which is a factor of 12 so first of all 36 24 and 12 this all are multiples of 12 so 18 is any which way out 6 is a factor of 12 20, 12 is a factor of 12 24 and 36 is out now we are just left with 6 and 12 out of this two numbers which is the factor also and multiple also the number itself a number itself is a factor of itself and a multiple of itself so that is how you get a 12 so even if you don't solve much don't rush to solve the question always pay attention to it that does you actually require to solve it or you could just make it out with the options and a few steps to you know do it fine let's go ahead with the more part gcds which are HPF also highest common factors. If the integer n is the largest divisor or a factor which is common to a set of more than two or more integers. LCM is often taken together. GCD is taken separately. Always remember this. And that is the highest or the largest divisor or a factor which is common for both the numbers. Many a times it is one. So like for prime number it will it will always be one so like factors of 36 we have 1 2 3 4 6 9 12 18 36 for 48 we have written it as from 1 until 48 now if you find the gc common factors are 1 2 3 4 6 and 12 out of which 12 is the highest number you can often break that 36 into the powers of 2 and the prime factors and you can do that least common multiple is the lowest common multiple that is common for more integers so like we have multiples of 6 as 6 12 18 for 9 i have 9 18 so common number is 18 so that becomes an lcm lcm is pretty easy but now this is one thing that i want you to pay attention to gcd and lcm with a minimum and maximum exponents so how do we actually do with the exponent powers when we deal so first of all always make sure that if it, if it is written as four always convert that into the prime factors always deal into the prime factors if it is nine make it three if it is 27 three cube if it is six make it two and three if it is 10 make it in terms of two and five so the first thing is always always deal with the prime factors now going with the gcd you need to find the minimum values of the exponent which is common for LCM, we always take the maximum values of exponent of each prime factor. So GCD always, always take the minimum value common for common prime factor. So suppose I've got 2, 3, 5, and then I've got 3, 5, 7. So I cannot take 2 and 7 because they are not common. And now then I start seeing what is the minimum power of 3 and 5, which are common in both. This is how I find GCD. For LCM, I'll take all the numbers, 2, 3, 5, and 7, and I'll take their highest power. So that is what we call as LCM. So now let's talk about this question. If M is the least common multiple of X and Y, and N is the greatest common divisor of X and Y. So M is LCM, N is HCM or GCD. They have expressed X as 2 to the power 4 times 3 squared, and they've expressed y is 2 squared 3 to the power 3. What is the value of m over n? Recall the concept of greatest common divisor. It is the greatest common factor of two or more integers. LCM is the smallest common. We are dealing with the, first of all, make sure that x has got prime factors. Yes. y has got prime factors. Yes. They've been raised to exponent. That means we have to deal with the minimum and maximum exponents to be taken. Now x is 2 to the power 4 3 to the power square y is this do we have any other number here except then 2 and 3 no lcm is m so we, let's calculate the lcm for this so m is equals to i'll consider i'll take all the numbers i'll take 2 also i'll take 3 also so i've taken 2 i've taken 3 now i'll raise 2 to the highest power of x so I've got 2 to the power 4 and 2 is squared. So the highest power is 2 to the power 4. Then in this, I've raised with 3 square, but here I have 3 cube. Highest power of 3 is 3. So I'll take it as 3 cube. So my LCM is done. Now for x 
GCD, I'll take the common numbers. Now, the my luck is good that I have the common numbers two and three itself. But I have to take the minimum exponent because two to the power four is not common. It's two squared that is common in both. So I take the minimum exponent. That is why we say the minimum exponent. So that's two squared, and then I've got three squared common. So I'm now the value of m and n. The value of m and n should not m over n. That is what question is asking. Should not be a big deal for us. Two to the power four, three cube, two squared, three squared. You can cancel out three squared. To the numerator, you'll be left out with three. You can cancel out two squared to the numerator. You'll be left out with two squared, which is four. Four times three is twelve. Your job is done. Prime factorization. Always write the number as a product of its prime factor. Any number which is greater than one can be factored by prime factors. Like fifty can be written as two times five squared. If this is a question. If n is the product of all the integers between eleven and thirty inclusive, this is not factorial. It is eleven times twelve times thirteen times till thirty. What is the greatest possible value of integer k such that three to the power k is a factor of n? See, it's almost a similar kind of question that we did three to the power k. What is the highest possible value of three to the power n of fifteen factorial? But that was factorial. But it it will not be uh, so difficult for us to solve because there is a product involved. We have to find the greatest possible value, and then we have to divide, find a factor. If you have to find a factor, we could consider the multiples also. So this is how I am actually remapping all those concepts that can be applied in this particular question. So I've read the question. I have all those remapping done of all the concept that can be applied in this question to solve, so that I don't have to go back to the question and reread and understand what is to be done. Now, when I'm ready with all those particular concept to apply, I'll just start with the solution. N is the product of all integers. Okay, so it's eleven times twelve times thirteen till thirty. That is equals to three to the power k. Now. We I'll just find the multiples of three from eleven till thirty. So those are twelve, fifteen, eighteen, twenty-one, twenty-four, twenty-seven, and thirty. Now left out all the numbers when they are getting multiplied. They're integers, so they'll give me the integers. So now I have just reduced or I've trimmed that particular data set, and I'm just dealing with the multiples of three because my question asks me the same thing. Three to the power k has to be factor of n. So what should be that particular k? So now, so now see this is wherein you have to understand the previous question. I have showed you how to write that one, two, three till fifteen. I took some multiples of three, three, six, nine, twelve, and fifteen in a set, and I was still showing you the other numbers which were left out. So that is wherein you guys have to see this that that was the first sort of that particular pattern. So we have written it. But if the same phenomena or the concept is applied in some other question, I can definitely understand that there is no sense even to write those remaining numbers because they will be integers because we are dealing with their products. So in the first time, you always always you know uh, write in detail. The second time when you have the same sort of question, you cut short. Third time, you always cut short, and this is how you improve your. Shortcuts. This is how you improve on your time. Okay, getting back to the question, it says twelve. I'll write it in terms of three. Four times three. So everything can be written in terms of three here, because they're a factor of three. So when I see here, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, and then I have got nine to the power three. So nine itself is three squared. Six again. It so you know it's much better to break it to terms of Prime factors. So 10 to the power 3 will have 1. 9 to the power 3 will have 4. Uh, 3. So we have got 4, 5, 6. 6 to the power 6 times 3. So that is like 2 times 3 times 3. So 8, 9, and 10. So 3 to the power 10 is your integer. The k value is 10. Okay, let's talk about the number of factors again. Very easy. How do you find the number of factors? So, if there is a number m, 
when you're saying factor so m equals to a b that means i'm divisible by a remainder zero i'm divisible by b remainder zero write the m in terms of a prime factor product Now, whenever you write a simple number like six, it's two times three. Okay, fine. Whenever you write twelve, it's two squared into three. So there would always be some power on the prime factors, or there may not be. But again, if there is no power, that means it's one. So now, how do we find the number of factors exactly? Is we increase the power by one. If it is like two squared, I'll increase the power by one, so that becomes two plus one three, and then I multiply all those uh, increase part together to get me the number of prime factors. Now the question here is, why do I increase it? So now listen to this particular concept very clearly. If suppose I have a number eight, and if I'm dividing it by two. I'll divide it by four times. Two times four is eight. But at the same time, I'm getting four, which can also divide the same number eight to get me two. So with your one factor, you always get an another factor. So that is why we always raise that power or increase that power by one. Now this is a very Good question. If it says n equals to two cube and three square, what is the greatest factor of n? So you need to understand the greatest factor of n out of these five options that are given. So now, when this particular number is dealing in terms of prime numbers and prime factors raised to a power, we need to understand that this n can be written in terms of let's bring out their power which is 3 and 2 increase it them by 1 so 3 plus 1 is 4 2 plus 1 is 3 4 times 3 is 12 so i need 12 so i've got 12 factors so that particular n has got 12 factors into it and i have to find the greatest factor now now the greatest prime factor here is 3 because we have just got 2 and 3 and 3 is the greatest prime factor The greatest factor is nothing; it's the number itself. So it's two cube times three square, which is seventy-two. That's it. So logic is GCD plus prime factor plus increasing the. So now this is wherein integers goes into tricky part. They will always make you apply two to three concepts mixed together, blended together in a single set of questions. If an integer x and one eighty two have the same prime factors, now see, don't worry about that x to be unknown because you could easily get the amount of prime factors or the number of prime factors for one eighty two. But the ridiculous thing is, x is greater than one eighty two, so it's not the same number. What is the least integer value of x to x over one eighty two? So now, if we talk about this. we need to talk about the prime factors here we will recall what is a factors we will recall we need to express that in terms of prime numbers raised to some powers and we have to again recall a fact that prime uh, the powers have to be added by one increased by one and then their product has to be taken so now the solution part here starts 182 can be written as in terms of 2 times 7 times 13 so now x could be 2 squared 7 1 13 so that means i'm just multiplying it by 2 or i may multiply it by 7 see i cannot multiply it by 3 to get another number because they have got the same prime factors they've not got the same number of prime factors they've got the same prime factors So the next number that I'm trying to see should have the only prime factors of two, seven, or thirteen. Doesn't matter how many times they're repeating. So I can get it by multiplying it by two or seven or thirteen, or I can multiply it by two square seven to the power four ninety five, thirteen to the power five thousand one. I can get it through the n number of ways. But I'm dealing with the least integer value. 
and numerator over denominator will give you a least integer value only when first of all the numerator is an integer secondly 182 should be the highest because numerator has to be the smallest in this one now they say x is greater than 182 x is greater than 182 so x could be anything but again you have to take the least part of it so it's a greatest integer function that you could say it's a float function so you have to take the least out of all the greatest number so that particular number would be just 2 because think about it that 182 is a number then if you have to increase it you can increase it by 2 7 or 13 out of which 7 and 13 times multiply to 182 will give you more bigger number the smallest number that you could have is only multiplying it by 2 so that is where in you get the least integer value as 2 now the alternative approach that i could have applied if i were you was looking at the options i can get to know this fact then 182 which is 8 plus 1 which is 9 9 plus 2 which is 11 adding up all the digits i can get to know that 3 and 9 cannot divide this number If three and nine cannot divide this number, then three cannot be the prime factor to it. Five will not divide this number because my unit digit doesn't have zero. The only left out part is seven or two. Seven would definitely divide this number, and two would also divide this number. But they are talking about the least integer value, so my least is two. My answer is done. So even if I don't know what is prime factors. how to get the prime factors what is the formula if i forgot it even i can solve this particular question through the options so this is why i say don't rush always pay attention to the question greatest prime factor and the smallest prime factor this is what we found out right now so let's say if n is equal to 10 factorial plus 9 factorial what is the greatest prime factor of n Now, first of all, we need to make sure that we write this in terms of prime factorial. So, n factorial is equals to one, two, three, up to n. Ten factorial would be ten times nine factorial, and so on plus nine factorial. We can take that that nine factorial common, so that becomes ten plus one, which is eleven. That means this particular n is nothing but eleven times of nine factorial. Now, the greatest prime factor of n for this particular question would be eleven. because you don't have 13 you don't have 19 the maximum number that you could have is 11 and that is a prime factor so this is wherein we are ending that you know we have a start getting that uh, feeling that now integers how do they mix up the concept and apply they will never ever ask you to you know apply on a single set of logics so i want it you know if uh, i want you to definitely go back and see this video i want you to definitely go back to last two videos which were very important like uh, inequalities and absolute value i hope that uh, you guys are seeing to it if you have any more questions you can just drop me an email on uh, my uh, official email punith at mathrevolution.com if you wish to talk to me directly uh, be it from your non math background how to start how to understand uh, from you know how to raise the score you can often book your consultation call from the you know the links are there on the gmat club and our web website as well and uh, i'll always say you know stay away from the conventional approach because that will definitely end up uh, either you know wasting you a lot of time so just have a heck of variable approach as soon as possible for yourself and uh, this are the wide range of our courses that you could definitely see on to our website as well so we have a solution set then we have a trial pack and that is for all the students so once you sign up you have a free access to the lessons the approaches the concepts to get a confidence into it and then end up uh, you know taking any package if you're looking to raise your score you got few days or weeks time left shortcut q51 is one of the best uh, course that i suggest If you have time right now, say suppose you are appearing in month of end of Feb or March, I'll always suggest to go for a VIP package. 
uh, for the discounts you can always always write to me that's not at all a problem and if you feel like you have a very much discipline and a, you know private tutoring sessions you can always always register for the, all those uh this webinar will be soon uploaded on the youtube so you could often see under our tab uh having said that yeah, this is something you know i would say for the free resources register yourself for the math revolution you won't won't give up a math for 30s and 40s and you are most welcome to always write me on info@mathrevolution.com for your any query related to package or the services and if you have got specific queries for math or verbal you can always write me puneet@mathrevolution.com uh having said that um i'm um, thank you for your patience and for your time today and you have a great day ahead bye bye